The primary problem with a concussion is that if you have had a, a brain trauma and then within a week or two you go back to playing full contact sport and you get hit again, you are at risk of something called second impact syndrome. And that basically creates a cellular toxicity in your brain and you effectively die. I've always been an incredibly active kid. I played every sport under the sun and especially around the house got up to a whole bunch of no good as well. The problem is when I was younger and had all these little accidents and incidents, you get loads of bumps and bruises and cuts on your head. With it being the 90s, we just kind of went back to school the next day and moved on. Turns out now with advances in medical science and technology, we've started to learn and discover that kids and professional sports in particular as well, are starting to suffer from severe medical cases of concussion. So the concussion is a brain injury that results from some traumatic event, usually a collision of sorts either directly to the head or transferred from another part of the body like the neck where the brain actually moves inside the skull and that results in some neurological functional disturbance of the brain. In other words, the way the brain operates is changed. Your brain is then in fluid and it hits against the side of the skull and comes back again. So often what happens is you might get hit on the head on this side, but actually most of the trauma happens on this side of your head. So we were playing a warm-up game for a provincial tournament against an a inexperienced, I think, a guy's team and a bit of a wet field and I went down to catch a low ball and a guy shot up and I, I can't, don't actually know exactly how it happened, but I got a, a knee or a shin to the bridge, front onto the bridge of my nose and so I broke my nose in about three or four places. Many people look for structural change in the, in the injured brain, so an abnormality on the scan or a bleed or something. And although they're probably very microscopic changes, we can't really see them very easily. So we have to measure changes in brain function. There's different areas of concussion that can be explored. So there's the cognitive, which is your feeling a bit foggy and not being able to concentrate and poor memory recall. But it can affect your sleep patterns. So either you can't sleep or you just sleep all the time and you just feel fatigued all the time. And then there's also a emotional side, like you might get more irritable or more angry. And then there's the somatic side, which is the side that I can work on. And that's basically to do with your headaches, your dizziness, your sensitivity to light. You get what we call exercise intolerance or um, dysautonomia. So what happens is if you normally can run for 30 minutes on the treadmill, the amount of energy that you have to use to be able to run for 30 minutes, you now don't have that surplus of energy in your system. There's a reason why if and when a player takes a blow to their head, he's immediately pulled off the field. He needs to be assessed because once you suffer a concussion, you become that much more susceptible to more injuries. If you've had repeated concussions, the first thing is that you're more likely to suffer further concussions. The second is that those concussions may take longer to recover. And then of course the big issue is, are there long-term changes to the structure of the brain that will permanently affect the way your brain functions. We need to understand that there's a big difference between taking a bump on the head and suffering long-term damage. Some may get concussed, others may suffer for weeks or months or even years after the incident. There are two factors. One is the immediate da uh, danger when you go back too soon. The brain is still very vulnerable. You're more likely to have a concussion and the repercussions are likely to be more serious. Now those may be what we call catastrophic, really serious brain swelling and injury. Uh, and, and you know, admission to an ICU and we've even seen some cases of death with players going back too soon. And then of course the more subtle but longer term and perhaps more permanent changes which might occur. And those are what we're not quite sure about at this stage but that's where the research is heading. 80% of people will recover from a concussion within three weeks and there's 12% that develop what we call post-concussion syndrome. To put it in perspective, Pat was the only one in the, in the last five years that's had a post-concussion syndrome. So he's, in other words, he's the only one that's taken longer than four weeks to recover from a concussion. From the research that we've understood, the people that don't make a good recovery are the ones that have had 
multiple concussions or had a concussion, wasn't rehabilitated properly and then got a second knock. Um, and people that have had previous like ADHD or previous migraines or previous um, like depressions or anxieties, those seem to be the ones that don't recover as quickly. So if you've already have an imbalance or potential imbalance, which is perhaps being held in check by medications, and then you have a, a second insult to that brain, it can really cause that much more havoc. And similarly with attention deficit disorder in a brain which is susceptible to headaches and migraines, one that's been affected by encephalitis, etc. Those may be factors which just soften the brain, if you like, and make you more vulnerable and make you take longer to, to recover. So in Pat's case specifically, being a, a migraine sufferer in the past, um, sort of started to put two and two together that that could be a factor in Pat's case. And, um, and so he took a little bit longer than, than usual to get over that concussion last year. With new information surfacing every single day, it's difficult to treat every single one of these concussion injuries with the same brush. As Dr. John Patricios explains, the science is not yet conclusive, and because of that, a trial-by-trial -trial basis must be used. The high-profile cases are the professional type of sports, where there are medical resources. There are experts on the side of the field who can do immediate evaluations, etc. For 95% of collision sports, those aren't available. So at a schoolboy or club level, it's an if in doubt, sit it out scenario. The problem is that if the kids don't do the significant break straight after the concussion and or try and go through it or try and play the next week's rugby game, even if they don't get concussed, they have a much slower recovery. So if you don't catch it properly in the beginning, it then can go on for three to six months after that. Whereas he was hospitalized and then saw us on the Monday. So we had him right at the beginning, just off out of the noise, out of the light, out of it like a more toxic environment for you and slowly bring them back in. But if we try and throw them back in too quickly, they actually just, they almost like go backwards again. I was a bit of an emotional wreck for, um, for time. It felt like I was spiraling and there was no reason, external reasons for it. And whilst there certainly have been growing concerns around head injuries over the past few years, it's not to say you shouldn't ever get back on that bike. People are going to fall off bicycles, they're going to fall off horses, kids are going to bump their head you know, in the playground. So we need to be able to manage concussions, it's a reality, and similarly in contact and collision sports. We can reduce the incidence, certainly, and that is, that is happening in, in, in most sports that have made interventions. And most importantly, we can, what we say in rugby, recognize, remove, and refer. So make sure that those involved in the game know how to recognize the symptoms and signs of concussion, remove that player, from the area of, of play and contact and refer them into a network who can manage them medically and return them to play at the right time.